I hope you're okay with public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, this program is really good at making me be so. <laughs> okay. We all, everybody's situated? Everybody's comfortable? Yeah? Cool. See? So, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming to my uh, master's defense presentation. I'm going to be talking about e-scooters in Oregon, recommendations for regulations. Very exciting title, I know. Uh, thank you, Anne and Mark, for agreeing to be my project chairs. And let's get going. Um, assuming by the amount of people here that everybody is familiar with what e-scooters are, but how many of you have actually ridden one? And how many are looking forward to a potential scooter share program coming to Eugene? Awesome, great, because that's exactly what's on its way to happen. And that's what my research is focused on. And you might be asking, why did I spend several months researching this? Why couldn't Eugene just make it so? That is a great question. And it's one I would have been asking myself just a couple of months ago. But to really find out, let's go into the history for a little bit. <coughs> The first shared e-scooter fleet showed up on the streets of Santa Monica, California in September of 2017. That was just over a year and a half ago. They showed up unannounced and uninvited, like a bad house guest. They then spread to other cities in much the same way, much the same fashion. And technically this wasn't illegal because if a city did not have any proper formal legislation saying that e-scooters were not allowed, Everything was above board. It was kind of like the Wild West of e-scooter times. Cities in which this happened, like Santa Monica, found themselves hastily scrambling to put together regulations to help govern where and how scooters operate. Other cities, like San Francisco and Portland, saw the writing on the wall and decided that they needed to get ahead of the curve, or ahead of the e-scooter, and try to put together some sort of regulatory body of literature. Out of this time, the pilot program arose as the preferred regulatory method of choice. A pilot program is essentially where companies apply for a permit, and if they are granted that permit to be able to operate in a city, they agree to abide by a certain set of rules and regulations. If they don't follow those rules and regulations, they could be subject to fines or even having their permit revoked and being asked to get out of town. Um, so with this in mind, I ask, how have cities regulated e-scooters to date? And what have cities' uh, goals been through those regulations? I selected four case study cities along the West Coast, Santa Monica, San Francisco, Portland, and the city of Eugene itself. Using those cities, I conducted a content analysis of the regulatory documents for e-scooters in Santa Monica, San Francisco, and Portland. I also looked at the city of Eugene's contract with Social Bicycles, now Jump, to see what they did for bike share and how that might be adapted or changed for scooter share. Informed by that, I also conducted interviews with city staff and active transportation advocates in those case study cities. I also wanted to speak to actual representatives from the scooter companies in those cities, but I was only able to formally sit down and talk with representatives from Lyme. During my literature review, I was able to determine five uh, key areas of best practices for e-scooter regulations. There's permitting and fees, and that is basically then used to help administer the pilot program, evaluate it, manage the public right of way, and potentially also fund infrastructure upgrades. There's the fleet size, so that's the number of units that are allowed to operate in the city at a given time, and this could be either fixed, meaning it's a flat number, or it can be dynamic, meaning that that number of scooters can increase or decrease. There's enforcement, that's areas like um, where scooters can actually operate, where they can park, device specifications, maintenance specifications, equity, so that's um, where scooters, geographic areas where they are told that they have to be located. It's also things like low income plans and requiring service be available in multiple languages. 
And then there's open data and reporting. So this can be both real time or archived. And it's things like the number of trips that happen per day and origin destination information. Through my concept analysis, I was able to find out that all cities are pretty much hitting all the markers except for Eugene. Uh, with their bike share, uh, Eugene is a little different in how they operate for permitting and fees in the other cities and the fact that the city actually owns all the bicycles. And then they contract out the operation of the program to Jump. So the city is actually paying Jump each month for this service instead of vice versa. Uh, there is no mention of equity anywhere in that contract, uh, but when I was talking to city staff, I was able to find out that there is outreach going on to like the Cornerstone Community House, and there are adaptive bicycles available on request, but it's not very well marketed, so people don't really know about it. I was also able to find out that every city is pretty much aiming to facilitate a mode shift, meaning getting people out of cars and doing more walking, biking, scooting trips, uh, meeting climate change goals, increased safety. Every one of these cities has a Vision Zero plan, which is the goal of eliminating all fatalities and life-changing accidents due to automobile crashes, and affordability. So how can Eugene meet these goals? First, do the scooter pilot. <laughs> Scooters are a really fun way to uh, do short distance trips. A study just came out from NACTO from 2018 that showed that scooter trips are helping to double the amount of active transportation trips that happen. Just last year, something like 82 million bike share trips happened, and an additional 82 million scooter share trips happened. It's crazy, considering that these have only been available for a year and a half, essentially. Um, also, to require a low income plan and broad geographic deployment, especially in areas that have been designated as poverty hotspots by the Department of Human Services. And this would help the city achieve their stated goal of making this something that the entire community can use, not just the downtown core or university students. It would also help to fill that first last mile gap, which is essentially um, the distance between your home or a public, and then the public transportation uh, hub or your work or something. It would help get people to better connect to public transit and then help further facilitate that mode shift. And all of this would help reduce the amount of fossil fuel that is being consumed, helping the city meet their climate recovery ordinance. Uh, also, to require real-time and archival data reporting, so that would be like the number of trips that happen every day, trip duration, trip route, origin destination information, because then all of this helps uh, support arguments that can be made for infrastructure funding, like designated bike lanes because at the end of the day, it is a connected and protected system that is really going to help make people safe. There is, however, for all the good, there is at least a perceived dark side of scooters that does have some basis in reality. This usually focuses on areas of safety or parking. <laughs> These images are actually sourced from an Instagram account called Scooters Behaving Badly. So you can see that there is a basis for these concerns, but the reality of the fact is, this is really more of what's happening. Initial studies have shown that scooters are no more dangerous than bikes, and actually the majority of reported injuries that are happening are because people are falling off of them and doing things like breaking their wrists or maybe getting a concussion because they're not wearing a helmet. <coughs> Um, also, a study done by the Mineta Transportation Institute saw that in San Jose, only 2% of the observed scooters were parked improperly. So what can Eugene do to help facilitate safety and address those concerns? They can use those fees to fund infrastructure like we discussed. They can encourage helmet use, use messaging to inform users. So Portland, what they did was a really low-tech solution of just paper printouts attached with a rubber band to scooter handles to help tell people about the rules of the road, encourage them to wear helmets, help get that word out about safe riding. And in Santa Monica, they did a whole campaign called Know Before You Go, 
where they had billboards and signage on the sides of buses, again telling people about the rules of the road and how to ride safely. Incorporating scooter safety into education at public events. Eugene already does a great job with this with the party in the parks and Sunday streets where they do helmet giveaways and help uh, tell people about safe riding. So it would be really easy to incorporate scooter safety education into this. As for parking, uh, the city should require lock two mechanisms in their device specifications so that uh, scooters can attach to bike racks or other things, maybe even like a light, lamp light post, just to help prevent them from falling over after they've been parked. You can also transition bike racks into micro mobility racks. You can see, I think this is in Austin, it's really easily done with just some spray paint. That signage and some wayfinding really helps people know that this is where they should be parking. And you can also do a more high-tech route of requiring geofencing to direct people to those specific designated areas. And lastly, using unique ID numbers on each scooter so that if you see that it is parked improperly, you can help report that. And then that can be tied back to the most previous user of the scooter and they can probably get like a charge or a fine of some kind, much the way as if when you double park, you as the person who last operated that car are the one who gets the ticket for it. So, thank you very much. And any questions? And I have a question about the equity goals. Yes. And so I'm curious about, you know, if Eugene, for example, is asking how do we ensure equity, um, can you talk a little bit about potential geographic piece of equity and also think about technology access or banking access? Yes. And should they require that, and if so, how? Uh, yes, they should absolutely require that. Um, when I was speaking to city staff about this, they expressed a concern about enforcement of this, that what they've seen from other cities is that it has not actually helped facilitate equity goals by requiring these geographic requirements. Uh, but in Eugene, those poverty hotspots that the Department of Human Services identified, at least in 2015, uh, included areas like the Churchill neighborhood, Bethel, Southeast Eugene, and a couple of others that I don't remember off the top of my head. But I think it would definitely be a good idea to require deployment to those areas, again, to facilitate that goal of not having it be just for the downtown core and not just for university students. Um, there are options for tech issues about, like, you can do a prepaid card uh, that you can get at your local grocery store. I'm not quite sure how that would work out. I know we don't have that for bike share, but that is something that other cities have done for bike share. I haven't seen it so much for scooter share, though. Um, what else did you ask? I'm sorry. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I just, like, yeah. have a sort of a twist on that? Mm -hmm. And I'm curious common back and forth. Um, does a city like Eugene require those things for other entities that use the public right of way, like taxi companies or private auto owners or uh, any of the like? No, they do not to my knowledge. And so what makes scooter or bike share a different class of transportation that it should receive. I've been waiting for these questions Great. from you, Mark. I know. <laughs> um, been wait I'm waiting for great answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, in terms of the equity piece, I do not have a great answer for that. I've been stewing on this a bunch, and in the equity category, I just, I am coming up on the whole I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I don't, no one has an answer. How, you, how do you think about it? I have kind of an answer. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, at least on the taxi piece, you don't need a smartphone or credit card, right? True. So that's not, that issue is moot. Cars, you need licenses, and that's a whole other issue. Cars are, you know, they're leased. Um, and with the equity, typically taxes are required to serve all areas equally, whether they do or not. Yes. Very questionable, and I don't think cities enforce that well at all, no. um, even if they require it. So. <laughs> it's a broader enforcement issue, but I don't necessarily think because other issue, other companies are behaving badly that we should not require scooters to behave well. Um, <laughs> there's always room for improvement and not to perpetuate our horrible status quo that we have. Um, but yes, good questions and well, points, Mark. Nice. Um, I, in terms of thinking about, Evan, can I yeah, go. move? <laughs> I, have other, I have lots of questions. Um, 
I'm curious about enforcing in general. So yes. if we are requiring putting regulations in, into scooters, um, how would you recommend? How other cities enforce? Is it a fine? Is it reducing fleet cap, fleet sizes, for example, or providing carrots of you can have more scooters on the road if you meet certain goals? And what would you recommend Eugene do? All of the above. <laughs> um, and I think, at least from conversations with the city, they are looking at the uh, performance-based measures of a dynamic uh, increase or decrease. Mm -hmm. And that would essentially mean looking at data about how many rides per day are actually happening. And also those performance-based measures are, like, are the companies being a good partner in the community? Are they actually uh, maintaining their fleet? Are they actually uh, sticking to the rules and regulations? And if they are not following those rules and regulations, then they can either be um, fined, or if they have the dynamic fleet, their fleet is reduced, or they're asked to just simply get out of town. Do you recommendation over like size versus fine? Uh, I think I think that would go with fine actually because I think that can then potentially be money that can be used to help fund safe infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Do you want to ask a question? No, okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the fine is interesting. I've heard anecdotally from other cities that scooters sh companies don't care; they just throw money mm -hmm. at it and. Doesn't but I agree that extra money for infrastructure is always a good element. Um, thinking about the data, so I'm getting into the weeds thing about what will Eugene specifically ask? Like if they say, Garrett, you've done all this research, what should we do? Um, thinking about capacity of cities to analyze data, for example, so yes. real time versus archival. Um, what would the benefit of real time over archival be? And if you're re requiring archival data, at what level have cities done? Or would you request? So is it weekly, daily, monthly, yearly, et cetera? Uh, I know in Santa Monica, when they first started, it was kind of a weekly situation. But they also had four different companies that were operating at the same time. So it was really trying to um, figure out how to make all the moving pieces work. Mm -hmm. uh, stepping back from that, it's been more of a monthly requirement. I think that that would be a good idea for Eugene as well. Um, that archival data. I know the city has actually brought on somebody whose job it is to lead through all that type of data and create databases and stuff. So that's going to be a great uh, resource for the city. Um, and those real time, that was used in Portland. They were actually the first city to send out weekly tweets about statistics of scooter usage and whatnot. And it was really a tool that the city used to help communicate to the community that this is a valid form of transportation. People aren't using it just for a joyride along the riverfront. People are legitimately using it as a form of getting from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. So that then helps um, back up the arguments that they made for having a second scooter pilot. And Eugene can do the same. Okay. I'll turn over to you. Um. I wonder if you could talk about the difference between public and private ownership, and if, since uh, Eugene owns its own bike plate and has a different model, if that, um, what are the advantages, disadvantages, and is there, how to th take that and think about it with scooters, and then in general kind of public ownership or private ownership of our transportation system? An advantage of the private ownership, or I guess the public ownership by the city of Eugene of the bikes is the fact that if Jump were to ever fold as a company, the bikes are still there. Um, we can just find a different company to operate the system. Uh, every city staff member from every city I spoke to basically vocalized the concern of having a public service of transportation operated by a private entity, that the goals between that are very different. Uh, public transportation as a whole generally does not make money, but the social good of having people have access to education and jobs and all that helps outweigh that in terms of having a better economy. Private ownership doesn't really care about the social good in the same way. They care more about the bottom line. So cities have expressed a um, disconnect between the two and to be wary of that factor. And so if you were to recommend to you, I know that Eugene isn't thinking about owning the fleet. Um, I might say that they should 
do the same thing with uh, as they do with bike share, and that they should own the uh, scooters. On the downside of that, there is a lot of wear and tear that happens with scooters. Um, I believe currently they have a lifespan of something like three months before there is too much damage, and they're basically no good anymore. Uh, yeah, <laughs> companies are aware of this. Uh, actually, I was at a conference presentation, and one of the scooter operators said that it's like an industry dirty little secret that basically they took Razor scooters and attached a battery onto it and set it free on the streets. Uh, so there, uh, the companies are working to upgrade that technology, uh, but they're not quite there yet. So maybe when the technology is there, that's when we should do like an actual city-owned fleet. Um, I've got a couple. Uh, first one is: Does Eugene have adequate infrastructure for the increased? Um, use of scooters or additional bikes if it's bike share etc and secondly uh, if it doesn't what would you recommend the improvements be uh, and secondly um, has anybody looked into the um, you described e-scooters as um, active transportation mm -hmm. um, it seems rather passive to me and it doesn't encourage physical activity um, have there been studies on decreased physical activity due to e-scooters or other electric um, modes? Uh, not that I've seen yet in mean, those types of studies. Again, they've only been around for about a year and a half now. Um, in terms of infrastructure that I would recommend, there's always room for more uh, designated lanes. I'm saying designated lanes because we want to shift away from the terminology of bike lanes because then that creates the whole argument of bicyclists being like, WTF are you doing in my lane? Get out, this is my space, not yours. <laughs> like, um, so yes, wrapping our mind around that kind of shift of language, designated lanes. Uh, the city, I think, just completed a portion of their first protected uh, lane, so continuing that type of infrastructure. Um, we've seen from bike share that certain locations uh, at certain times of day tend to become inundated with bikes. So they have started slapping like stickers on public bike racks saying like, you can park your bike share bike here. So again, the signage that I was showing of just kind of like telling the public that it's okay to park there. Um, there's also been just simple fixes of, you know, nobody likes to take away parking, or rather, people like to take it away, people don't like to have it taken away. <laughs> uh, it's always a big argument, but if you can remove like one parking spot to uh, allocate it as a scooter drop zone, that's a potential thing. And that's just some spray paint on the street or maybe some thermoplast. Um, so, knowing that LTD is finally moving towards electronic fares, did any of these cities that you looked at look at like a consolidated fare system? So, Santa Monica was the only city that made any mention of integrating the two forms. Uh, when I spoke to city staff, and when I spoke to actually Rob Zico from BUS, the Better Eugene Springfield Transportation Advocacy Group, uh, there was talk about um, that type of fare integration, MOS, mobility as a service, where basically you can have one app that you can pay for your bike share, scooter share, uh, bus pass, all of the above with the one app. Um, so that's definitely a consideration. Um, I have not, in my case city cities, I did not see any evidence of that, but that doesn't mean it hasn't happened in other cities that I'm not aware of. No. In, in, uh Maybe this is more Santa Monica, but in the other cities, or maybe in other research that you've read, has the quick proliferation of scooters over this last year accelerated changes in infrastructure projects? Or, uh, well, not, or did people indicate that it might? Or like, how, yes. how are people responding to it? Cities are definitely using it. So actually, when I was speaking to somebody from uh, Portland, from Peabot, they were saying that they were able to use that data. They were able to see, for instance, along a specific corridor that there was a high amount of ridership happening every day, but they know that there is no protected infrastructure along that way, uh, that path. 
So people are probably then writing on the sidewalk, so they can use that data to be able to say, hey, look, we have all this ridership here, there's no protected infrastructure, we should put protected infrastructure here. And is that data different than what they saw through the bike share system there? Or is there some difference that they were seeing in people on scooters uh, carving out new paths that people were not doing on bike, bike share? Not to my knowledge. So in a, in a few minutes, we're gonna Ann and I are gonna ask everyone to, to leave so that we can talk about Karen without her in here and then give her some feedback. But are there other questions? You're welcome to ask any hard or easy or, <laughs> or curious <laughs> question you have. She's almost a master of the material. <laughs> I have a couple questions. I guess in towards the equity piece, and if my understanding of what you presented is that there would be areas targeted. Mm -hmm. But if it's a private company, does the economy bear it out? Like, we're just going to cite scooters there by obligation versus use or need. I mean, I guess that would be the variance to the taxi argument. At least that's mobile on its own. The scooter is not going to move itself. So I guess I'm just trying to understand the, I want equity, don't get me wrong. That's not my <laughs> argument. I, I just would, you know, if it's a private entity, how do we regulate that? We're just obligating them to cite something there that maybe goes against the business model. That is exactly right. Okay. So that was just my question. Like, how do, how do we, how do you make that? All right. And then the other piece would be. Can I jump in and add a quick point? Sure. So bike share often, so basically what they're finding is that bike share um, is being, there, there's equal desire to use bike share across income groups, but the use is not even because at least dock bike shares are only being placed in higher income areas. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a case to be made that these companies need to, that's, if the government's role is the public good and the, the private is the money, basically bottom line, mm -hmm. they need to be realigned. Yes. Right. Um, and then the last bit would be, is the, do any cities use like franchise agreements in order to, I mean, if we're starting to allocate right of way to these different groups, whether bike share, scooter share, et cetera, is there framework in there in other cities um, that are adopted by council? I mean, like, or is it just than departmental regulations. So, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding your question. Oh, well, I just, what, what, is the, what is the real weight of the agreement between some of these other cities where they have the regulations in place? Uh, so, the pilot program essentially asks, acts as a testing ground. Uh, there's no firm commitment. Okay. It's finding out what works and what doesn't before moving forward with the actual hard legislation. Um, I happened in Portland and in San Francisco was there was a formal legislation that allocated governance of that to uh, the Portland Bureau of Transportation or the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. I guess this is an easy question, but like, is there going to be like um, a cap for speed limit on those scooters because they go so fast in certain places and this is kind of a university campus? Yes, so a lot of that is governed by state law and in Oregon that is 15 miles an hour, um, so that's where we're at. Uh, there is some talk about using geofencing to help control the speeds, um, but at the same time you don't want to make them go to like five miles an hour because then people get annoyed with them just step off and like toss them to the side. <laughs> Any other questions? So if there is a uh, speed limit set by state standards, how is it going to be enforced? Is the city prepared to enforce it? <laughs> Uh, so part of that, at least what Portland did, was that they required that the bike, uh, that the scooter could physically not exceed 15 miles per hour. Uh, so that's a one way of going about it. Um, in terms of other enforcement. Just like universally. Yeah, that it physically cannot exceed 15 miles an hour. It just can't do it. So I think that's a way to do it. Okay. Miranda has the last so, question. I was going to ask, so, you know, there's been like drama around scooters and university campuses, is there going to be a geofence around campus or do you know how the city is working? So the city is actually working hand in hand with uh, the university, with transportation services. They want to make sure that 
they're both entities are on the same page for when this rolls out so that there's not one set of regulations for the university and a separate set for the city. Um, there have been some talks about using geofencing to help control that speed within the campus. Um, as for it, that's actually going to happen, I'm not sure, but it's in talks. Thank you very much. And I forgot we gave this option uh, or this requirement for uh, <laughs> 205 to come. <laughs>